What's up YouTube, Dal here from Zephyr, and today I am bringing you 10 of the best decks that can compete on a very tidy budget of $100 or less. Now the criteria for this particular video is to take into account the skill level required behind the deck alongside with the amount of cards it's going to be needed to complete it. I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just 10 structured decks that are all going to be great, not that they're bad options to be picking up and you will see a couple of them in this list, but I wanted to kind of encapsulate everything to kind of show you what you could be looking at to, what you could be building and the type of decks that they are. So with all of that out of the way, please smash that like button, hit that notification bell and subscribe so you don't miss out on any more upcoming content. So we're going to dive head first into the list and the first on the list in my opinion is Runic Generators. Now of course I know when you instantly hear Runic straight away you might think Runic Mr. Mine, Runic Fur Hire which is also a very good option as well and you can also consider Runic Sprite. But the way I kind of looked at it and why I chose Generators was that I felt that Generators probably required the least amount of investment. When you look into the Runics, I know they all came out in the Mega Tins, and I know they've definitely spiked up a little bit in price, which is why they're towards the lower end of this list, because I do feel that you might be putting in a little bit more investment in order to get it completely sorted. The reason I put the generators in here is I feel that they're kind of on a balanced level, and I feel that if you're trying to go for Fur Hire, you kind of end up with a mix mash of Runic with Fur Hire with the Sprite engine, and once you kind of combine all of that together, you're starting to rack up your prices. You look at Sprite Blue, Sprite Blues are £25 each, and you will see a couple of the decks in this list do require cards that are £25 each on their own. However, sometimes you can play them at lesser values, and when you look at the Sprite variant of the Runics, you are then going to need the Runic kind of core itself, plus three Sprite Blues, two Sprite Starters, and that's before you get into Gigantic and Sprint and the extra deck, not to mention all the other little ones. Which is why I kind of went with Generators, because I feel that Generators is a deck that is incredibly fun on its own. It's quite nice to put the Runics and the Generators together, as they do follow the same lore path as well, which is really, really fun. Now, some people might not agree with Generators or Runic Generators. I think they're incredibly fun there. I think they're very, very powerful. And I feel that if you learn the deck inside and out, it can definitely get you some massive wins at local environments, and maybe even surprise some opponents at higher events. Now, this list is obviously down to personal preference, personal opinion as well, of decks that I've played, decks that I've looked into, decks that I've faced and lost to, and just understanding the game mechanic behind them and why I think they're very, very good. Moving on to the next, dex, uh, ne next deck on this list, and this one is one of my more recent favourites, and that is, of course, Red Dragon Archfiend. Now, I would like to put this one further up the list, but when you see the rest of the list, you'll understand exactly why it's not further up on it. But the pure fact is, when you look at the Red Dragon Archfiend, it's probably the cheapest of all of the decks on this list to build and complete, and it's still very competitive. It might start to drop down a little bit in its competitive nature just because more people will get used to how the deck can operate. But what the deck does incredibly well is it has a lot of access to its starters, so its consistency is a total check. Then it's got a lot of extenders, so that even if you do slow down or stop one of the first cards they play, they still have four more possible options that can help them extend their board and still get to an incredibly end board. The reason it is not further up this list is with the pure fact that it doesn't have any natural built-in protection through lease or less sort of involvement. What I mean by that is the best way to negate something like Nibiru in a Red Dragon Archfiend deck is for the pure fact that you need to have access to um, Time to Stand Up, which you need Foolish Barrel of Goods to get access to, and then a level 10 Synchro Monster, which you're going to be able to need to get through with your Beastials before you hit your fifth summon. Yes, an inexperienced player dropping the bureau at the wrong time on this deck will make it a lot easier to be played through and you're allowed to continue to build your board because you do have cards like Scarred Red Dragon Archfiend. You also have stuff like Assault Synchron as well if you play that and Beastie with this batter. The deck is incredibly powerful, very, very fun to kind of consider as well and it is the most recent structure deck that's very easy to pick up. The one big thing that it is lacking in comparison to the rest of the structure decks that are going to be on this list is most of them are missing staples, if not are incomplete, which is why I feel that its competitive nature will start to get sussed out the further on down the line we go, but for now it can still do incredibly good things. I've definitely had success with it at local environments, I know that Mike and Joe have also had incredible success with the deck as well, and it's one of the ones that you can take to a local environment and you will get out some very good wins. Moving on to the next one on the list. Like I said, these are in no definitive order. I've tried to kind of contemplate them into decks that have already proven themselves, decks that are still ready to be cheap and easy to pick up, and the amount of cards you're going to need to get. So the next one is Scareclaw. Now, you can consider this Scareclaw Adventure. You can also consider it Scareclaw with the Fenris, because it is now starting to come down in price, which is absolutely amazing when you start seeing Fenris at about £12.50. And what I mean by that is I'm seeing people try and sell pairs of Fenris for £25. So to me, that is an absolutely insane bargain, and being able to build a deck like Scareclaw from that is really, really cool. 
The best thing about Scarecrow is it does have the ability to build a very decent go first board, and that's where the adventure engine comes in to give it that extra added line of protection. When you do then consider its OTK capabilities, again the deck is incredibly powerful. The only issue with its OTK capabilities is it is basically like a weaker version of Cash Tira to incre uh, increase the OTK. And what I mean by that is, if you were to go for an OTK Cash Tira build right now, you would then be able to utilize cards such as Lava Golem, which will help you blow out your opponent's board very easily. When you're looking at Scareclaws, Scareclaws need to rely more on the spells and traps in order to do that job for them, and they can't use a card like Dark Raw no more as consistently as something like Forbidden Droplet. The deck is incredibly powerful, very, very fun, and probably one of the cheapest decks on here to build that is not included in a structure deck. It's got so much space to play a range of hand traps if you want to, and like I said, it's already got different variants in the forms that you wanted to play Adventures, if you wanted to play Control Go First, if you wanted to play OTK, with or without Fenrir's, ideally you want them if you can get hold of them, but if the budget is even tighter, do not think that the deck is not playable without that investment, because it certainly is, and the Adventure Engine, within reason, can be picked up quite cheaply as well. If you didn't want to go down that route, it still utilizes its normal summon in order to start off its combos, so its consistency factor is definitely up there, and it's definitely a deck that I'll be looking to experiment with going further forward. Moving on to the next one. Now the next one I think is, it's just something that I thought of, and I was like, yo, this deck can actually do incredible things, and I feel that not a lot of people are thinking about it. And to me, that's Subterra Guru, but with Dragoon, so Subterra Goon. Now the reason I consider this to be a very, very good deck is it's one of the very few decks, if not the only deck, that can play a card as strong as Red Eyes Fusion and still continue to make its normal plays after activating Red Eyes Fusion. So being able to end your board on a Red Eyes Dark Dragoon plus a set, if not face up, Subterra Guru with the possibility of a Quick Plague Book of Moon-esque effect and a couple of set back row or a Fiendess as another form of a negate as well. I feel the deck can de definitely go under the radar. Now it will lose to certain combos of Dark Lord No More and Evenly, but let's be honest, 99% of the decks out there will lose to that as well. The reason I consider this slightly budget is if you are looking right now, while the deck is flying under the radar, a lot of people won't even consider there to be a huge amount of values in it, and with Dragoon being around as well, around about £10 card I've heard that it's getting even cheaper, you could swoop in and pick that up very, very cheaply, very easily, and have an incredibly powerful deck on your hand. The one thing that gives the Subterra kind of goon version a little bit more strength in comparison to its counterparts when you look at stuff like Trap Tricks or Labyrinth or other type of control decks is it does have a very good and powerful go second option. Let's be honest, if you wanted to play Forbidden Droplet in your Guru or if you wanted to just main deck Dark Ruler no, Dark Ruler no More to be safe, just being able to go Red Eyes Fusion, bring out a Dragoon without response can help you clear an opponent's board and put an incredibly powerful boss monster on the board. I feel that when you're looking at the main meta decks right now, it really does have an insane amount of power to be able to deal with a lot of those decks. And a lot of the decks will struggle to out a Red Eyes Dark Dragoon, not being able to destroy it, not being able to be targeted, and having that all-powerful Omni Negate on the board, not to mention its burn effect and its intact stats increase as well. Moving swiftly on to the next one on the list. So the next one on the list, in my opinion, is Exo Sisters. And the reason I've put this in here is the deck is pretty much 99% complete when you get it from the Megatins. Now, obviously, you do need to get the pieces from the Megatins. So you're going to be a lot better off rather than trying to buy tins and pull it, buying the singles for it as well. The reason I think Exo Sisters are still a great deck, especially when you look at stuff like Tier Elements probably coming back into the format, is Exo Sisters thrive off of Tier Elements movements from the graveyard. Not only that, but it's a deck that could play D Shifter, it can also play Goes and Match, and it has access to an OTK capabilities, and now with the Aritama and Sakitama engine, it has more consistency to get into its rank 4 plays. The multiple banish setups for its go first play when you're going through Magnifica, Michaelis, and of course the uh, Returnia does give it a very nice go first option. Now its weakness does come in the go second capabilities with the pure fact that it will rely on a card like Dark Rule No More in order to do that, to build up its board and then double banish in order to kind of push through what type of boards are being set up in the current meta. The fact that it has access to these hand trap floodgates and back row floodgates can be a game changer. And I do feel that it's a deck that you can build very, very cheaply. And if you do like the type of play style and mechanic of the deck and the way it works, it's one of them ones that could definitely do stuff in the future and still cause a lot of issues with the correct pilot. Swiftly moving on to the next one. I'm going to be talking about Trap Tricks. Now, I know this is a bit of a weird one, kind of considering when you look at the rest of the list, you could argue that Trap Tricks could go further down. But what I feel that Trap Tricks have that a lot of them don't is when they go first, it has that so much like in the grind state, I feel that Trap Tricks is one of the best. 
I feel a lot of people forget that trap tricks are mainly unaffected by trap effects. The fact that with the right board setup, they can protect themselves from being destroyed, they can protect their back row from being destroyed, they can play incredible floodgate type cards in the form of floodgate trap hole, which is a permanent book of moon. You've then also got the ability of using uh, Gravedigger's trap hole, there's a new banishing trap hole, you've got a uh, bottomless trap hole, you name it, the list goes on and on and on. The deck is very, very tilted in the sense that it can go first incredibly well. Going second is a little bit more of a struggle, which is why it kind of sits around the same spot with the rest of the decks that may struggle to do one or the other. But I do feel that once you get the deck ticking and the fact that it's really cheap, and when you buy three of the structure decks, you have 99% of everything there for you already, plus you already get your main deck staples of Ash Blossom and Evenly, it's one of the best investments just from that standpoint alone, not to mention that if you did want to play Tractrix as a control option and then you wanted to play something like Scarecore as an aggressive option, you could, in theory, build both decks on a very tidy budget and probably go just over the £100 mark while having a good control deck and a very good OTK deck sitting in the wings ready to go. Going on down the list, so we're now going to look at Sword Soul. Now I feel that Sword Soul is a deck that has been able to skate by I mean, some people initially thought it was going to get absolutely slaughtered on the banish way long ago, but then they hit the Wyvern card instead, Protoss, in order to make the deck a little bit more balanced. Now the deck hasn't been the same since then, but I do feel that without having to worry about a Rice Heart, which is constantly going to banish all their worms that they want to be utilising in the graveyard, plus the draw effects and the burn effects of Long One and Mo Yi, it's definitely a deck that is still around and still very much powerful. I would not be surprised if we see any of those at this weekend's YCS Dortmund. It'll be very interesting to see where Sword Soul plays. Quite like Exosisters, it has the ability to play quite a lot of hand traps and also has the ability to play floodgates like Rivalry. On top of that, it also has the ability for burn damage, it has the ability to Baron Protect, it has the ability for Graveyard Recursion, ways to out the board with stuff like Vishuda. Negates in the form of Tenyis, uh, sorry, negates in the form of Chi Zhao, Blackout as well for double pop if you need to. I feel the deck is a very, very good deck, and I feel that it's one of them ones that is just a fair deck overall that can be very, very powerful. Yes, there might be a little bit more scouring around to get the pieces you need, but they have had two lots of reprints. They've had the originals and the reprints themselves, so it should be relatively easy to pick up, and I feel that the most expensive card in the main deck itself will, of course, be Mo Yi. On top of that, the deck has quite a lot of space to play hand traps, which is one that you're going to be looking at. You're going to be playing a, ca uh, a control deck that is going to play less hand traps, just more back row, um, back row can control, or you're going to be looking at a deck that can play a lot of hand traps and be able to kind of build off the back of that as well. Moving into the next one, now we're into our top four. Now, top one is a bit of a personal kind of choice on this one, but I've gone with Dark Worlds. Now, Dark Worlds did lose like the, the threat of Rice Heart and a couple of threats of the Beastials, but it still has to deal with Draw and Lockbird, and of course it needs to deal with Shifter. However, with the right pilot, and again, I would not be surprised if you see this at YCS Dortmund this weekend, the debt is incredibly powerful. It's constant engine to keep going with the dangers, yes, is a blessing and a curse, because if you brick, the deck does nothing. If you don't brick, the deck can be incredibly powerful. But again, it's one of them ones where you buy a free structure that you have 80% of the deck already complete for you good to go. The ability to go first and hand rip on a consistent basis is absolutely insane because that gives you te te technically an auto win game one. You also need to consider with tier elements coming back into the fold and they're constantly going to be able to try and mill your deck. that You can play the tech card of the um, Neko main king and that's going to allow you to move to your opponent's end phase. The best thing about that as well is you can also set up your... Um, Dark World Fusion wants to Grefa in order to discard that king in order to skip your opponent's turn again as well. So you've got the ability to skip an opponent's turn, rip their hand apart, and just go second to build an incredibly powerful board. Now again, like I said, this list is personal preference. A lot of people might not agree with the list and shuffle the order around. It's in no concrete order. I just feel that there are ways of, like I said, being able to get the deck complete as quickly and as easy as possible without spurging a huge budget on it as well. Moving into the top three, now number three is Branded Despion. Now the reason I put Branded Despion in here is because it's already proven its worth. Yes, it might push you towards that edge of that budget, but with the Beastials being reprinted and becoming slightly cheaper, you can actually start to include them a little bit more. Probably the highest value card is, is going to be looking at something like Quem, Nadir Servants, which is also getting a reprint apparently in the anniversary set due in November, so it should become a heck of a lot cheaper to build. Not to mention, mainly the core cards for the deck came in a structure deck, and most people that have been playing Branded for a long time have already upgraded to Branded Fusion, so you should be able to get a complete core for around about £50, so roughly about $60 to $70, give or take, and there's just the little extras that you're going to need. 
The fact that Cartesia has been reprinted does make it incredibly easy in order to pick up the rest of those pieces because she is probably the main one you want to be going to. Then you want to be going to Dust Dragon Grignor and then you'll be looking at your Quem and that's how you're going to adapt your strategy. We still have access to the gimmick puppet lock as well. So you do have a very good option for going first. It doesn't auto lose to something like D shifter. Um, and it also doesn't lose to cards of the format, stuff like Droll, if you do consider that as well. What you've got to kind of keep in mind is that stuff like Unchained can be a bit of an issue for the deck, which is why Unchained is possibly going to be one, if not the top two meta decks for the format. But Branded is still an incredibly powerful deck that can be built and adaptive. That's the best thing about it is it has so many different variants that if you get bored of one particular playstyle of it, you can shuffle it up and play a completely different playstyle of it and get maximum value out of the deck. Moving into number two, and I've gone with Rika Sun Avalon. I think that Rika Sun Avalon is an incredibly undervalued deck, and yes, it does require the right type of pilot, but when it has a card as powerful as Con Con to be able to tribute your opponent's monsters without triggering effects, it's absolutely insane. We saw it do incredible things during the previous tier element format, and with tier elements being quite hyped right now and expected to come back into the game because of the lack of Rise Heart, then you can definitely expect that Rika Sun Avalon can definitely take back one of its top spots, and the deck has just had mainly all of its reprints, so it does become very cheap and easy to to get hold of and you also have easier access to the Fearon engine as well so you can build in your own sets of negates and give or take depending on what hand you open up like I said to break a board you kind of need something like Dark Lord No More and an Evenly even then something like Rika Sun Alavon still maintains a lot of control as long as they maintain that field spell. Moving into the top spot, now the top spot is of course Labyrinths. The reason Labyrinths are in here in the top spot is I do feel that it is the cheapest deck of all of the main meta decks and still deserves to be in that top five of the main meta decks itself. Yes, Big Welcome Labyrinth is rocketed up in price to be about £25 a copy. I do feel that you could play two, if not three, if you wanted to, but then I also feel the rest of the Labyrinth deck could be very easy to pick up in the form of reprinted staples and, of course, the reprinted core from the Megatins. A lot of people would have bought Megatins and either just had no interest in the Labyrinths whatsoever or had the Labyrinths, kept all the Labyrinths, was like, right, okay, cool, I'm going to play the deck and then saw the price of Big Welcome Labyrinth and they're like, right, I'm getting rid of this now. The fact that Eradicator is still available to the deck as well is insane, and it's got more support coming out in Age of Overlord, which might tip your budget over a little bit, but if you've already been able to complete the deck, you are going to have an incredibly powerful control deck going forward into the new format that can do very devastating things. So that's it for my 10 decks that I feel are way within a budget restriction and can definitely compete. A couple of honourable mentions are stuff like Crystal Beast. I feel that Crystal Beast Conclave Control is still an incredibly powerful deck that can be utilised as well, but I do feel that it falls outside of my personal top 10 for the pure fact that I believe that it needs quite a lot more to get going. Um, yes, it'll be in a bit more of a stable uh, stable position without needing to worry about uh, Rice Heart. Another one, of course, is just pure control Kashtira, because Kashtira can still play D-Shifters, they can play Macros, they can also play D-Fissures, um, D-Shifters, you name it. Not to mention they still have access to everything they need. The only issue is it definitely goes way, out, way outside the budget because you're going to need access to your extra deck cards, possibly Pot of Prosperity, and then you're looking at stuff like Theosis, Pressure Planet, everything else in between. But that is it for the top 10 decks. If you do have any questions at all, by all means, please put in the comments down below. I'll be more than happy to answer them. And if you do have any suggestions of what you feel would be in your top 10, then by all means, please put in the comments down below. I'll be way happy to see what is in your list. Like I said at the start of the video, do not take this list as this is the definitive top 10. These are just 10 decks that I feel are incredibly budget, very competitive, and something you should be looking to put together. Whether you're new to the game, coming back to the game, or if you're just like, I want a bit of a change up, what type of control decks can I look at that isn't going to break the bank? What type of OTK decks can I look at? And what kind of all-round decks can I look at in order to move into this new format? But for now, thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, share. Till next time, as absolutely always, stay safe, and of course, happy dueling.